What is up everyone, this is Kate Lemon, and today we are here with episode 15 of Spill the Tiro, a JRPG podcast where we go over some JRPG news, releases, mechanics, what I've been playing, want to play, and more. And in this episode, we're going to be talking about a couple of things like my first experience with Persona 4 Golden, some Reynata's news, how I'm looking forward to Kingdom Hearts 4, and more. You know, if you, if you notice, if you've listened to the previous episodes, you know that that was a new tagline. I'm going to be trying to do that more, try to sum up the main points of the episode right at the start. So, like, if you don't give a shit, you can just leave. And if you do, you can stay. So, hopefully that is more useful to people. And hopefully I remember to do that every episode. I'm going to try. I'm trying to make the tagline better and better every episode. So, that was the iteration this time. But uh, before we get into the episode, like always, some housekeeping stuff. I want to talk a bit about the Final Fantasy VII Remake. Let's play. A new episode came out, and I did a couple of new things with the newest episode, which I'm going to be trying to do as I go forward. So one of the things I believe I mentioned I want to do, which I did with the newest episode is, at least I tried to do technically, is I wanted to do shorter episodes. So before the previous episode, the way I released episodes is I recorded, you know, I had a recording session for the game, and I took that entire session, made it into an episode, and released it. No matter how long the session was. So if the session was an hour, I would have edited it, cut it down, release it. If that session was four hours, I would cut it down, release it as a single episode. But what I wanted to do this time was cut up the session into natural episodes where it would make sense to release them as episodes. So for example, the news episode you saw, that was like about a third of my recording session and it ended up being a 15 minute episode and i think that was maybe like an hour and a half of footage that made that episode whereas the entire session was actually like four hours so i'm doing that in the hopes that shorter episodes are more enticing for people to watch and then they click on it um funnily enough because just uh, with how you know i ended up cutting it up the episode wasn't that short it was still like 50 minutes five zero so it's not like it was that short but i feel like the next episode might be shorter hopefully maybe like 40 minutes or 30 i want to see if i can get one I, I if i can get an episode to 30 minutes i think that'd be nice but um it's not really up to me it's pretty much whenever i see a natural ending point in the game and that is up to the game and not me but yeah that is one thing i did another thing i did and this is something i do with, like with some other channels that i edit for but i added a small highlight reel at the start just so you kind of get an idea of what happens in the episode which uh, i pretty much as i was editing i took what i thought was kind of funny or like i guess enticing and I have like a 20 second reel at the start of the episode montage style going through like what i think the funniest parts are or just interesting parts i don't even know if they're the funniest parts so that is also something so if you click into the episode you can just watch the first 20 seconds see that what it's about and then like dip or keep watching i also do want to make that into a short to release that separately the short i just haven't done that yet but uh, yeah that is just a couple of changes i made with the final fantasy 7 let's play and i'm I, I don't know if i'll be doing this anytime soon but i may maybe doing more let's plays in the future of like games that are like older final fantasy 7 remake technically it is an older game but i was doing that to the lead of rebirth but i think that's kind of a mistake because it took because of that it took me so long to get to rebirth whereas i think i may do less plays of stuff like kingdom Hearts 3 is a game i want to do because i've only played it once and i think a second playthrough as a let's play would be enough motivation for me to play it again i was thinking of doing trails of cold steel 1 again because it's been a while since i played that and i think it'd be fun to come back to the game after i've experienced the entire series now so those are something I'm thinking about. I don't know if I'll do this for sure. I don't know if I'll do it the same way I'm doing the 7 Remake Let's Play, or maybe I'll do it as, like, a stream, maybe. I'm not sure, but, yeah, those are just some ideas that I've had in my head in terms of Let's Plays. Another thing is, I've noticed that because this podcast has been going on, like, for pretty long now, I do run the risk of repeating stuff. I don't think I have so far. I don't think I've repeated anything in the segments in terms of, like, if I say I'm looking forward to a certain JRPG in, like, Episode 2... Hopefully I don't repeat it like this episode, things like that. So I do need to think about like hopefully spreadsheeting my stuff or something because literally every episode now when I'm writing up my notes, which takes a couple of hours, I'm like, did I talk about this game? Did I already like mention that I'm looking forward to it? Because I don't want to repeat stuff. So in case if people are listening, they don't, you know, I don't want them to hear the same stuff. So that is something that I'm thinking of doing too. Hopefully that is something I put into action soon. And uh, also another thing I want to mention about this is I think I may need to very soon slightly change up the what i'm looking forward to jrpg section of the podcast only because it's been getting harder and harder every single week to find a jrpg for that segment so if this is your first episode that segment is pretty much me just picking a jrpg that's not out yet and talking about why i'm looking forward to it and kind of going into it and not too in depth but kind of in depth of what type of game it is why i'm looking forward to it my experience with the series if i've already played some of it etc and i've been you know this is the 15th episode and like Coming up with 50 JRPGs you're looking forward to is kind of hard, and if I want to do this long term, I don't know if it'll be possible. Even uh, this episode is kind of, I'm, I'm going to be talking about Kingdom Hearts 4, and that's kind of like a rough 
game that's not even like a real game we know anything about yet and so i may be changing the segment up in the future i'm not sure how maybe i'll do like theoretical jrpgs i'm looking forward to like theoretically a trails game that can have x and y that's something i'm looking forward to or like if there's a jrpg that did this and i'm looking forward to that i may be doing something like that in the future i'm not sure because as of now i don't think this segment will last too much longer if i keep going kind of the same path of picking a jrpg we already know about and talking about it because there are not that many jrpgs i'm looking forward to i'm surprised i even came up with 14 to 15 jrpgs already so that is something i'm thinking about too and before getting into the podcast, a couple of things that I always do. One thing is I always recommend something that I've been doing or that I have that I think is cool. One of the things I'm recommending, and I've talked about this a lot already, is this piece of kit. For audio listeners, I am showing my PlayStation Portal. The PlayStation Portal is a portable device from PlayStation that is really fucking good. And I remember when it was announced or when it came out, it was getting a lot of flack for being a device that's streaming only. Unfortunately, I feel like a lot of people just like... This may be a hot take, but people really need to stop thinking backwards in a lot of ways. Like, I don't think we need portable consoles that are like the Switch or the Steam Deck where they're always like running on device. I do think it was time for some kind of streaming hardware to really happen because internet is pretty good these days. And I, I'm not sure about the rest of the world, but at least here in Canada, we have fucking fantastic internet. So like, I'm like, yeah, get a streaming device, like someone release one. And so I've always been playing remote play on my phone anyways, but I haven't played as often as I wanted to because... You know, it's on a phone, it's not the most comfortable, and I would have to bring a separate uh, dual sense to play comfortably, etc., etc. But I I had played, like, East 9, I played completely on my iPhone. I had played um, Final Fantasy 15, I believe, on my iPhone and on my laptop remote play. But since this has come out, the PlayStation Portable, or PlayStation Portal, I've played so many more games. Before this, I used to play, like, maybe one game or complete one game a year, maybe. This year, I've already completed maybe, like, three games, maybe plus. I played Remake finish that i played crisis core reunion finish that rebirth finish that persona 4 i'm playing almost done that and that was only like in the last like three four months and that was all on the portal so that is something that like i'm very impressed with and like it's easily like i don't think this is a subjective statement if you have the internet for it this is the best portable console right now like objectively it is because you are getting console level graphics and you're getting a stable 60 fps which no other handhelds can really do. Steam Deck doesn't really do that. The ROG Ally probably doesn't do that. And like obviously Switch and stuff doesn't do that because you just can't be streaming if you have good internet. So the PS Portal, if you do not have it, if you have good enough internet, I strongly recommend you get it and try it because it is amazing software-wise and also hardware-wise because it is easily the most comfortable handheld too. It's really light, it's comfortable. It literally just feels like you're holding a dual sense. So yeah, I recommend it if you don't have it. And before I go on too long, let's just get into the podcast by showing a random Spirit Away card, which I do every time. Let's pick a random card. Here we have the Four of Spades, which is just a building. It looks pretty nice for the audio listeners. It's kind of like a building with a clock on it. It kind of has like a Twilight on vibes from Kingdom Hearts, honestly. It looks very nice. And from there, we will go into the first segment of what I've been playing. So in terms of what I've been playing in the last week, it has been quite a lot in terms of hours I've put in. Uh, first two games I want to mention really quick. I'm not going to talk about them, buddy, because they're not technically RPGs. One thing I've been playing is Undertale. I have never played it. I know nothing about it. So I'm playing that for the first time. I'm playing it as part of my work on another channel. And so like... Like, I'm slowly going through it. I just met Sans, so that's funny. But yeah, that is a game I am playing. So I might talk about that here. I don't know, because I know Undertale is considered an RPG. I don't know if it's a JRPG. And another game that's not an RPG at all, but is Demio. If you guys haven't heard of it, it's a cool, like, role-playing, like, dice board game type thing in VR. I've been playing with my brother. It's very cool. So if you haven't heard of that, check it out. But uh, yeah, let's get into the main JRPGs that I've been playing the last week. The first one is Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I already talked about it uh, very, very long in detail last week, but I realized that I was holding off till the end of last week's what I've been playing section to talk about the side quests, and I just completely forgot. So I'm going to be talking about the seven Rebirth side quests today. Now, when I played 7 Rebirth and went through it, I actually did absolutely zero side quests. I didn't do a single one because I didn't find that they were that good in Remake. And so in Rebirth, I didn't really want to bother with it. And like, if I really wanted to, I could I could come back to it. And so I beat 7 Rebirth. And honestly, I was not planning to do the side quests, but I did a couple and I kind of enjoyed it. Then I started doing kind of like the random blips on the map and I enjoyed that. And then before I knew it, I played like another 10, maybe 15 hours of just doing side quests. And so I think the side quests are actually pretty good in it where you pretty much the format or the structure the side quests take is you are doing a random side quest and there's a character in your party 
That's kind of part of it. So if you're doing a side quest, it might be Barret, who's kind of with you and kind of talking with you during it, and you may learn something about him. And if you're doing another one, it may be Red, who's the focus of this one, and he's kind of talking with you during it. It's not that they're the focus of the side quest, it's more like they just happen to be the party member of the game decided to pick to talk, you know, about the side quest with you, and through it, naturally, you may get some plot stuff about it. Like, I think Barret talked about his daughter in one of them, and you learn some new stuff about that, and things like that. And so I actually really like that because... I think side quests, at least in the Trails games, I love them because they sometimes give plot, you know, stuff, plot information in it. But also more than that, they give a lot of good character moments. And as long as there's some character moments, I do think side quests are worth it. Now, while Rebirth doesn't have huge character moments, like I said, it's just sometimes a little conversational bits you get from it. I do appreciate that there are character moments at all in it. And so I do think the side quests have been pretty good from what I've played so far in Rebirth. I also like that you get some information from side quests that I personally did not know about. One of the things is there was a side quest where Hojo was part of it. And during the side quest he was pretty much looking at a camera feed of chadley and he pretty much mentioned that he made chadley i don't know if this is new information i feel like that kind of sounds familiar but kind of not but like that was kind of like mind-blowing to me that like oh hojo made chadley and it's even more surprising because he called chadley like number seven or number six or something like that alluding to there are like five to six more chadleys in in his lab i guess so i thought that was pretty cool there are cool little moments where like tifa's talking to this bar owner and the bar owner's like oh yeah i want to make you guys a drink it's pretty famous it's from a bar called seventh heaven and then you know he finds out that tifa's kind of the bar owner there and then they talk about how tifa's probably gonna open up a new bar and then he'll come visit that was a very cool character moment so little things like that that you probably would never get in the story and kind of gives you more insights into the characters that thought were very cool because yeah i never really thought about seventh heaven you know since remake and the fact that tifa's actually thinking about reopening it at some point i thought that was a pretty cool pretty cool moment that i just never thought about and i really appreciated that and in terms of like the other things besides the side quests you can do queen blood matches which i enjoy you can do random like map stuff like get towers uh find chocobos find moogle places you can kill fiends you can find treasure chests, things like that. I think the quest line that I enjoy the most are the proto relic quests. Now, if you don't know what this is, but pretty much there is like a quest line in each area of the map where you're trying to find a proto relic. I don't know what it is. It looks like you're getting pieces of armor, but pretty much uh, an example of one is I found, you know, the location of the proto relics. I went there, turns out some bandits took it and you pretty much had to chase them around the map about three to four times until you were able to catch them, fight them, take it and you found one proto relic. But when you find the proto relic, there's like a mini cutscene of like cloud just like being in a different area. It looks like kind of like an old time Japan location and he sees this kind of like weird swordsman that kind of has six arms and then you're out of the flashback and then I did another pro relic quest and you learn a bit more about that uh, swordsman I don't know what the plot is about because the pro relic quests are really fucking weird one of them in one of the areas is like you get transported into Fort Condor which is like a game from the intermission uh, DLC where you're kind of like a board game and you literally have to play as Cloud Thief and Barrett in the board game and beat the six armed swordsman. I actually haven't been able to beat that line because I just can't beat the final one. There is another one where you actually have to follow uh, the black rope figures and follow them around the map to see where they're going and you find out they're also going for a piece of the proto relic. And what's weird is it ends with the rope figures turning into Sephiroth and then using the proto relic to summon the six armed swordsman and you have to fight the swordsman. So like... I don't know who the swords guy is. I don't know if he's supposed to be a character that I'm supposed to know from a previous Final Fantasy game. I don't know if he's, just, if he's just an Easter egg. It's weird that Sephiroth summoned him. I don't know if it's related to the story in terms of that. But like, there's clearly some like weird storyline going on with this six-armed swordsman. So I thought that was interesting. There's probably three, maybe four more locations that I need to do the Pro Relic quest to get the full you know, story of who the swordsman is. But I thought it was pretty cool that there is some kind of plot that I get to follow. And yeah, I, in terms of the side content, there's just a fucking lot in Rebirth. I didn't even touch on, there's a location where you get a pirate's map and you get to follow like a pirate's map to find treasure. I haven't touched that yet. But yeah, I just played like the 10 to 15 hours of side quest, but then I kind of stopped playing because I want to move on to new games. But uh, that is something that if I am bored, I may just jump into Rebirth once in a while and kind of, you know, chisel down on those side quests and see how far I can get. And so yeah, that, that, that's pretty much all my thoughts on it. And from here, We'll move on to the next game I want to talk about, which is Persona 4 Golden. Now, Persona 4 Golden, this is a very interesting game to me because I really wanted to give a fair shake to the Persona series because I know how huge it is. Like, if you talk about JRPGs, Persona usually comes to the conversation. But specifically, more for me, why I've been interested in it is because people compare, at least online, I've seen people compare Persona and Trails pretty often. And if you've listened to this podcast before, you know that Trails is my favorite game series. And I think Trails of Cold Steel or Trails of whatever is like peak gaming. I think they do world building fantastically, characters fantastic story writing fantastic gameplay i really like too so like i put you know trails pretty high in terms of gaming and whenever i heard people talking about persona and trails 
not always, but a lot of times what I did hear is that Trails is kind of like a Persona Lite or Persona is like a better version of Trails. And I had no opinion of that because I literally had not played Persona that much. But from the little I had played in the past was I had played the first 10 hours of Persona 5. And from my experience of that, I thought it was pretty much without, you know, being too blunt about it. I thought it was a worse Trails. Character wise, it didn't seem as strong. Story wise, it wasn't really hooking me in the 10 hours. And like world building wise, it was a lot shittier to be completely frank where like the school wasn't built out you couldn't talk to that many npcs etc etc but then again i didn't really make that my final opinion on persona because that was just the first 10 hours of you know jrpg and i believe persona 5 is like 100 hours or whatever so like i didn't consider that you know a fair opinion and so i want to give persona 4 golden a fair shake and see how that is because i believe people say persona 4 is a good persona game so i'm like let me give that um a try because it was on sale and so far i am 30 hours into it I don't know if I'm near the end and pretty much my opinion on it is the same as it was with Persona 5. I do think, not only do I think it is a light trails game, I would have to say it is a light, 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 light trails game. As in like, I don't know about how Persona 5 Royale is because I think people think that that's a peak of Persona. Persona 4 at least, like I don't think it touches trails in any way. Like I don't think this touches even like the worst trails game, but I, I am... What's weird is, like, the game is good. It's not bad. Like, I'm not saying it's bad. It's good. But it's kind of overstaying its welcome. But at the same time, I keep playing it, which is weird. Like, I'm kind of at the point where I don't want to play anymore. But at the same time, I do keep playing it. Because a game loop is just kind of, like, pretty easy. But at the same time, it's a very loopy game. But yeah, let's just get into the specifics of the game now. So, obviously, I'm going to be talking about some spoilers of Persona 4. So, if you don't want that, I would just say skip to the next segment. Because I will be done with the what I'm playing segment. But, uh, roughly, the story of Persona 4 is you are this kid who comes to this town of Inaba. And as you come, some murders start happening. Where people randomly will be murdered when it's very foggy outside. And they will be seen hanging up upside down off like a tv antenna for example and as you play the game more of these murders start happening and you start figuring out why they're happening maybe as in like you notice that the people who come on tv are the ones who are getting murdered and so slowly you start building up this team of friends that are able to go into a tv use your persona fight you know these weird shadows and then you end up saving the victim before they actually be able to get killed in the real world and so there's a victim that the game starts with and there is another victim that you save there's another victim you save there's another victim that you can't save things like that so that's the entire like base of the game this mystery of who is this murderer and i think the premise is cool i always like to say like personally like if you're doing a story you have to have some sort of mystery in it like i don't think you can have like a story that's satisfying that doesn't have some kind of hooker mystery pulling you in and the fact that the story is literally just a mystery is fine with me because it is pulling me in the unfortunate part of this game, I think, is it is a mystery, but it is, it is, I think it's too simple. Whereas, like, a lot of other games have, like, the main A plot, but they have, like, these B plots. They have these different character stories and blah, blah, blah. They have, like, a lot of things going on. But this game is straight up just a linear ass mystery of, like, yes, this, this, there was this first victim that died. You couldn't save. There's another victim. This is happening. Okay, you save them. Okay, there's another victim. Okay, you save them. And there's, there's just this plot line. There's nothing else. And I think my biggest issue with Persona, and like, I don't know if this is true with the future Persona games, as in Persona 5, but like, so I'm 30 hours in, the amount of story I've gotten in the 30 hours, you could have easily told me in like 3 hours, like legitimately, because most of the game is just you playing that game loop of like, you know, you go to school, you can hang out after school, you pick who you hang out with, then you restart, you go to school, you pick who you hang out with, etc. And I get, I get the game loop, I get that you're supposed to like bond with people. But the thing is, Trails is the same thing where you get to bond with, like, your friends. But Trails does it less often. And even then, I felt like the bonding I had in Trails was more satisfying. Like, when you bonded with someone, you actually got to have a nice cutscene. You talk about, like, whatever the story is, character moments, blah, blah, blah. And you got enough in the bonding moment where I felt good. I'm like, I'm good for a while. I don't have to bond with this person. Whereas in Persona, you get so many opportunities to bond where, like, a lot of the times you don't get a cutscene. You just get, like, a thing that says, like, you bonded with this character very good and so and because you get so many opportunities it doesn't feel special like straight up like between victims like there have been like 10 maybe even like 20 days of you just fucking looping the same day and hanging out with people and like nothing really happens and like you got to the point i'm like i just wish i can just like i want to say i wish i could just skip these days but at the same time i still go out and hang out with my friends because they kind of want you to and it makes your persona stronger apparently but he but it still doesn't benefit me because i'm not really fusing that many persona to be honest and so like i get what the game's trying to do but i think it's too game loopy 
if I can see the game loop so obviously I don't think that's a good thing I do think it needs a, a few more wrenches thrown in where it does change up the formula because as of now I think it's getting to the point of the game where it's not satisfying anymore even to the point where like I was only playing just to see who the murderer is I still don't really know who the murderer is and like I don't really care anymore because it's taking so long. At one point, funnily enough, at one point, um, I won't I won't be going to specifics, but there was a character where like everyone was convinced like this was a murderer and they got locked up. And when that happened, I was like, is this the end of the game? Like, is was that the murderer? Was it this random fucking character that we barely know? And I was honestly ready to be like, okay, this game sucks. Like, if that is legitimately the ending, I think like all my opinions of the game just go downhill. Thankfully, it's, it seems like now where I am at, that person was not the murderer and the, sh the real murderer is still like at large, which I'm like, okay, good. They did something different and that was kind of interesting. So if that original person was a murderer and the game just ended soon after that, I would have to <laughs> say this game sucks, honestly. But uh, thankfully that didn't happen. But yeah, story-wise, I do like the premise. It's just very, very simple. And the gameplay and everything just like doesn't really... It's just, it's just everything is just very simple like like honestly this sounds degrading to say but it is a very light 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 trails game like gameplay wise trails is a lot more in depth and is more fun uh character wise i think trails is more a lot more in depth and you learn more um story wise trails is more in depth world building trails is miles better and like that's not to, to the fault of persona because trails is a series persona like each game is different and so like i'm not even faulting the persona games for that it's just that like unfortunately i came into the game with an expectation that it was like trails but better but it is not and so like i think the game is good don't get me wrong i'm not saying the game is bad at all but it is kind of to the point where like it is an okay game to me now like by, by the time i finish this i don't know how long it's gonna take unless the story like takes a random turn to make it like a lot better i think the game is like firmly like a six to seven out of ten for me which is unfortunate because like i really want to try persona and like i thought it was gonna be like some like amazing thing and for all i know maybe someone can tell me in the comments maybe persona 4 is like not seen as one of the better games maybe persona 5 like blows it out of the water i'm not sure but as of my experience with Persona 4 Golden, I don't think I'm going to be playing Persona 5 anytime soon because I'm kind of bored of this loop already. And like, based on the quality of the storytelling, like, I'm not sure if I have the faith to really go into 5 anytime soon. But yeah, I think those are pretty much all my like succinct thoughts about it. I have like notes of me like going to the specifics of random stuff, like different characters that I bonded with. I pretty much bonded with a lot of characters. I maxed out a couple of people like uh Marie, uh my dad, who, or the, the Guardian who's taking care of you, uh Yosuke. And things like that but like the thing is like it doesn't even feel like that special to bond with characters because they give you so much time to bond like i feel like if i really tried i could bond with everyone and probably max everyone i'm not trying to do that and that's kind of naturally happening which is funny and so yeah it's just that's how the game ended up being and like the last thing i'll mention before like moving on to the next part which is the actual um combat gameplay i think the combat is like fun enough like it's just like a basic turn-based game but i do wish they added more than that because I know that there's a persona system so i'm like oh cool i want to see like how they use a persona system to be different but gameplay wise it doesn't add anything which is weirdly enough because the personas pretty much replace the magic system in any other jrpg so like whereas in another jrpg you might have attack items and magic in this you have attack items and persona and your persona does a magic for you sure it's different where you can switch to different personas and you can fuse different personas but i don't think that's enough for it to be like a whole new like you know innovative system where like when i'm playing it i don't really feel like i need to fuse personas that much either so i'm like i'm just playing through it <laughs> pretty lazily and i think the dungeons are way too fucking long too and so like at that point i just put in a podcast and just kind of rush through the dungeon and i do explore the dungeons too but like they are definitely the boring part of the game unfortunately so i i, I did not want to come into this podcast episode talking negative about the game but as i was playing the game like i started off very positive I'm like the story is really fucking cool i'm really enjoying it and i just kept going lower and lower and lower as i saw that they weren't doing anything new and they just kept going down the straight path but yeah that's my opinion on persona 4 golden so far hopefully by the next time i talk about it if i do keep playing it i will have more positive thoughts but that is just my legit like straight up thoughts i'm just being completely transparent but yeah that is what i uh thought about the game and from here we'll go on to our next segment of spill the Tear, which is a jrpg that i'm looking forward to now a jrpg that i am looking forward to is kingdom hearts 4 now this is a funny pick because we straight up don't really know anything about this game it is like we don't even know when it's gonna come out for all we know it could be like a kingdom hearts 3 where it won't come out for another decade but uh, like i mentioned in the intro of the podcast i am running out of ideas to talk about in terms of jrps i'm looking forward to so i thought i would bring this up because kingdom hearts 4 is obviously a game that i'm very much looking forward to and i, I just want to talk about like roughly what i'm expecting from the game what i want what i think will be in it etc and so so far like what we know of the game is like sora is kind of in shibuya kind of like yazora's world and 
we know that like that's gonna be the home base for the intro of the game and like i don't know if we know much more than that there may be some like specific plot details that we, we might know that i'm not you know too sure of but in terms of like what i want to see i really hope that kingdom hearts 4 kind of like becomes a funnel of every single kingdom hearts thing we've gotten so far what i mean is like right now we have like the main kingdom hearts line and we kind of have like birth by sleep that kind of joined with kingdom hearts 3 and then we have unchained key which is kind of its mobile thing and that went into dark road and then we have missing link which is i think the continuation of that what i hope is kingdom hearts 4 kind of takes everything and makes it into a cohesive story where everything just connects seamlessly and you kind of have this joining point where like you can connect everything pretty easily and you don't have to think of all the games as separate things anymore and I know they're technically already combined like that because Unchained Key was part of um, Kingdom Hearts 3, but there's still so much that like haven't connected properly, like the Foretellers, like how are they going to be in the game? Uh, Dark Road with Xehanort, like we got so much of Xehanort after he's gone. Is he actually completely gone from the, from the games? Uh, Skylad Kylum, we're going to learn more about in Missing Link. How is that going to be reintroduced maybe in Kingdom Hearts 4? So there's so much about that that we don't know. And obviously this isn't even mentioning like in Kingdom Hearts 3, the entire Yozora business, which is, which to me is still fucking confusing because... It's a game in the Toy Story world, but, like, it seems to be a very plot-important thing where Yuzora is an important character, and, like, people have theories that the driver with him in that secret cutscene was, like, uh, Luxord. So, like, there's clearly a bunch of stuff happening in terms of plot there, so I really want to know what everything is, and I'm hopefully they answer a lot of questions and kind of, you know, drill down into, like, who Yuzora is, what's that about, and join up the mobile gameplay storyline seamlessly to where everything just makes sense and on top of that i'm kind of interested in how they handle like it being the start of a new saga because technically this is the best game if they ever want to like to just make huge changes and they have an excuse for it whereas with the previous games if they made like very very big changes it'd be like that's kind of weird we're at the end of the Xehanort saga don't really fuck with it but now that we're at the start of a new saga mechanically they can do whatever they want and i'm curious to see if they're gonna do something are they gonna keep it the same where it's just pretty much the same combat the same structure of you go to Disney worlds and then you finish the story or will they go more bizarre? Will they have non Disney worlds? I know people were saying like, technically this, this is Disney, but I know people were saying like, maybe they'll add more live action stuff like star Wars. I personally don't give a fuck about that, but like if people want it, sure. Um, I, I personally, what I'm hoping is please focus more on kingdom hearts, original worlds. What I mean by that is like, let's, let's make it one to one. <laughs> I would love if like every other world was like Disney world, then a kingdom hearts, original world, Disney world, then a kingdom hearts, original world, that way disney fans are happy because you have disney worlds kingdom hearts original fans are happy like me that have kingdom hearts worlds whereas kingdom hearts 3 was like disney 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 and then you had some original stuff at the end whereas hopefully it's more balanced in kingdom hearts 4 which it could be i felt like kingdom hearts 2 felt a bit more balanced in that way where it did not feel like it was like a hammering of disney all the time but we'll see how that goes and especially because i believe there's a quote a long time ago i'm not sure whether it was from namora or someone else on the team where uh one of the things they mentioned is they don't have final fantasy characters anymore because the kingdom hearts cast is big enough now well prove it <laughs> like if you have a big enough kingdom hearts cast like use it better like show more worlds that they live in like i don't think we always have to keep going back to radiant garden twilight town you can introduce new worlds with original characters i think that would be cool too and like even if those worlds end up being like non-disney i think that'd be cool like a twoey world I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. Would be cool. I haven't played that. A Final Fantasy type world would be cool. Like anything that's non Disney, I think would make it more diverse and more interesting because usually those characters have more of a connection to the actual Kingdom Hearts plot, which I personally find more interesting. So I thought that would be cool that they can do in Kingdom Hearts 4. And with that, that pretty much, you know, rounds up my thoughts on what I want from Kingdom Hearts 4. We'll go on to the next segment, which is JRPG news that I think is cool. As always, my news stories are sourced from Gamatsu. So if you want to kind of check out the original articles, go on to Gamatsu and you'll be able to see the news from the past week, which is what I'm talking about. Uh, the first thing I want to mention, just a quick honorable mention, I won't be going into it at all, but Assassin's Creed Shadows was kind of revealed. That's not really a JRPG, but it takes place in Japan, so that was cool, so I just really wanted to mention that really quick at the start. But that is all I'll talk about it. Uh, next news story is Tokyo Zanadu EX Plus for Switch has been delayed to July 25th in the West. Just wanted to mention this in case you're interested in the game, and also, I didn't know Tokyo Zanadu was even coming out for Switch, which is really cool. If you don't know what Tokyo Zanadu is, pretty much if you took the Trails games took away everything trails about in terms of like story but kept the visuals the gameplay the mechanics and just put it into a new world with a new story that's what it is and what's really cool is that it's a one-off so if you want the trails experience but you don't want to commit to like you know the five ten games whatever of trails 
you can play this and get the same gameplay experience from it and really really i i loved it so like if you really want that experience you can and it is the ex plus version there's a version i played and i'm sure there may be more changes but i remember the main change was that throughout the game maybe like every other chapter you would get to play as a different person and as you go through the story you kind of see how the two stories connect so i think that's pretty cool and yeah so if you're interested in anything like that check it out and there is a new tokyo zanaru game coming out which is really fucking cool i believe they said it doesn't connect to the original one which is this one so We'll see how that works out, but yeah, it has come to the Switch on July 25th if you're interested in it. The second news story we have is a turn-based RPG called Ozara Radiant Echoes is announced for consoles and PC, and it is a tribute to JRPG Classics. Now, this technically isn't a JRPG, but I'm talking about it because apparently it's a tribute to JRPG Classics, and the quick logline that I'll read off really quick is... Restore peace to the vibrant world of Ozara, where the mysterious elemental entities known as Zols answer to humans' prayers... Lead the resistance against the merciless invasion orchestrated by the neighboring nations of Vidoris. Now, this game does look kind of cool. It is, um, like it says, a tribute to JRPG classics. It's not coming out anytime soon. I believe I read somewhere that it's coming out in year 2026. It kind of has this cell shady style. But if I'm being completely honest, the the what what it has in similarities to JRPGs is, is like gameplay related. But anything more than that, at least from what I've seen, there isn't that much to see because it's very early right now. But I don't see really any other similarities to it in terms of like. Like, not even visuals, which I thought was kind of weird because they have, like, this section on the Steam page where they said they're teaming up with, like, huge names of in terms of, like, Japanese composers and Japanese designers. I believe some that have worked on the Legends of Mana games, Golden Sun, etc. And so, like, when I heard that, I'm like, oh, that's cool. So, like, we'll see some, like, character designs that you'll see more in JRPGs or, like, or hear music. And in terms of, like, the, there's they have this short trailer I saw. The character designs don't look JRPG-esque, which I thought was interesting. Like, if you, if you look at the game, like, at least when I look at the game, I'm like, this looks like a Western, like a Western game. Like, if I, if I didn't know anything about the game, I would think this is like a Ubisoft game, for example. And so, in terms of that, I don't know what happened in terms of having that Japanese designer, but, but, but like, it's supposed to be this JRPG tribute, so we'll see how it goes. There's not that much information on it, but I still want to bring it up in case anyone is interested. It is called Ozara Radiant Echoes, if you are interested. The next new story, and pretty much the last new story, is about Reynatis. And uh, Reynatis pretty much launched a trailer almost a week ago. And there's two things to talk about. One is that they had an April Fool's joke where they said they were going to collaborate with uh, Neo The World Ends With You. And that was just a joke because it was April Fool's. They revealed that the joke was not a joke and the joke was on the people because it's real. And so they are going to have a collaboration with The World Ends With You. I don't know what the collaboration exactly is. They have like this short like 50 second trailer that I watch. Um, there's no English subs, but pretty much they show the main character or one of the main characters of Renatus, uh, Marin, kind of fighting. And then he walks past and talks to this girl in a bunny hoodie, which I'm assuming is uh, The World Ends With You character. And they talk a bit and that's all. Again, it's in Japanese, so I don't know what they said. But uh, it's kind of cool that yeah, they are collaborating because I even said this in the episode when I talked about the collaboration. They released like key art for the April Fool's thing and I'm like, this hero looks like really fucking good and it seems too mean to make this an April Fool's joke because it, like, I, like, if I was a fan of, of uh, The World Ends With You, I'd be like, yo, this is pretty fucking cool. So I'm glad to know that it is a real thing for the fans of Renatis and The World Ends With You so you guys are getting this out of it. And another thing that i believe this is new information i don't think i've seen this before but they do have a release date which is september 27th in the west so it will be coming you know in a few months and uh, yeah there isn't really much more to talk about that i thought the trailer was going to be a bit more beefy but it was that short trailer between the world ends with you character and the Renata's character but yeah that is some Renata's news that we had in the past week too and from there we will go on to the next segment which is jrpgs that are releasing this week in terms of the jrpgs that are releasing this week i usually source them from icicledisaster.com and rpgsite.net for some reason icicledisaster.com is down hopefully not permanently i really like that website so i pretty much source all them from rpgsite.net and i have two games to talk about um honestly both of them i'm not really interested in but i thought i'd still talk about them one of them is a neptunia game maker r evolution on the ps5 ps4 and switch and it is coming out on may 14th which is yesterday from recording so it is already out and i'll read the logline real quick which says it is an era of war between the factions of game makers three goddesses of game makers were defeated in the race to win the market share of game sales and perished they were branded as failures and left to fade away but then all of a sudden older neptune a girl who has traveled through many dimensional worlds appears out of nowhere she is then asked a favor by those three goddesses to become the president of their company and hopefully resurrect their dying game maker this sounds fucking insane <laughs> i don't know what the context of this is from what i understand neptunia game maker is a a spin-off from another series and so because they say older neptune is a character i'm assuming the main game series has a character which is like the normal age neptune and so the the plot seems wild but like uh gameplay wise and visual wise it looks it kind of has some like visual novel style cutscenes the combat is like 
um, real-time combat. It is uh, anime-style 3D Genshin Impact looking. And the combat kind of looks like Tales of Games if you've seen any of those. But yeah, I, I believe I've talked about this game in the past before because when I was looking at it, it seemed a bit familiar. But it's one of those games that has a UI that's similar to Final Fantasy 16, where on the bottom right, they have kind of like the four face buttons and each of them are different moves. And so yeah, that is a game that um, apparently came out yesterday on the PS5, PS4, and Switch called Neptunia Game Maker R Evolution. And the second release I want to talk about is Toho Genso Wanderer Foresight on the PC, which is coming out today, which is May 15th. And uh, this game has a logline too, which is Reimu Hakurei loses a battle and faints. She comes to and finds herself at Hakurei's shrine. She's unable to remember anything. What had she even been doing in the first place? Having regained consciousness, Reimu sets out together with her friend Marisa Kirisame to solve incidents. Uh, pretty generic logline, but it is a character who doesn't remember what happened and she's going to solve incidents with her friend. This is a lot more 2D compared to the other one. It is a visual novel style more heavily. It is anime style 2D. There is combat, but it's kind of like this top down down very chibi big-headed characters grid-based uh, battle system what i thought was weird is i was reading the steam page and it literally says that this is a fan-made game based on the toho series i don't know how that works i don't know anything about toho but i always thought toho was like an anime or something but um i guess it's an open ip if like a fan-made game can be put on steam for it and so yeah that is something that i noticed too but yeah toho against the wanderer foresight coming out on pc today which is may 15th and those are all the releases for jrpgs i was able to find this week and so we are moving on to the next segment which is a jrpg mechanic that i think is dope now the jrpg mechanic that i want to talk about and this is something that i've noticed in jrpgs particularly and some i've enjoyed some i haven't enjoyed but i want to talk about true endings or secret endings or real endings or whatever in games and i want to talk about how i actually like them i like when there's true endings because in very specific situations actually I have had games that have had true endings which I didn't like, and pretty much the only time I like a true ending in a game is when it's a game that I really, really love, because it means I get to play more of it. So when I'm really loving a game and I don't want it to end, when I when it's revealed that there's more to do, as in there is another ending I can get, or a secret ending, or whatever, or an alternate ending, I'm like, oh hell yeah, let me do this, let me keep going. But if it's a game that's mediocre, that I'm not enjoying that much, I'll be like, eh. I won't go for the other ending, and I've had games like that too. And so, I want to talk about a few games that have had true endings that I've enjoyed, and so like, spo I'll give the spoiler warning of the game before I talk about it, and then you can just, you know, skip like 10, 20, 30 seconds or whatever. But yeah, let's get into it. So the first game I want to talk about that I really enjoyed the true ending of was Trails of Cold Steel 4. So spoilers for Trails of Cold Steel 4, starting now. And one of the main reasons I love the ending, and this is just kind of like, you know, cheap, because you can't really compare other games with this, but it, it was the ending of a tetralogy. So this was a fourth game in the series. And not only that, it was kind of a culmination of like the Trails in the Sky games and somewhat the Azure games. And so like you have this game that's ending kind of all these series in a way. And so like it is a pretty big game. And when it ended, it was so fucking funny when it ended because you have this huge like history with these games and you're in this final battle and you're finally fighting the final bad guy to end all things. And you're fighting as a hero and you're fighting the villain. And what ends up happening is, like, the hero dies with the villain, and then, like, they kind of explode into this white dust, and every single party member you've had, they're kind of near the final battle area, they just look up, they see the white dust falling to them, they look at it, they're sad as hell, and then credits roll. And I was like, what the fuck was that? I'm like, well, is that the ending they chose? Like, I, like really? Like, it was this depressing-ass ending, I was expecting, like, there to be a time skip, show me, like, how every character is doing now, maybe they're older, or, like, how everything's going, blah, blah, blah. But they straight up ended it like that. I was like, what the fuck is this? And I'm like, is like I don't know how I feel about it, but by the time the credits ended, there's pretty much this message that's saying, like, go back to the base of the tower to get the true ending or something like that because the final boss was, like, at the top of the tower. And this is an example where I'm like, not only did I really love this game, so I was completely fine with uh, playing it even more, but also that ending was so fucking funny and out of left field, I'm like, yes, I want I want to know what the true ending would be. That's so pretty much what you had to do is, you had to climb down all the way back to the base of the tower, which is kind of annoying, go outside, there was a portal, you go through the portal, you fight a boss, come out, climb the entire tower again, fight the final boss again, and then you got the true ending, which you'd expect, where you beat the boss, it's a happy ending, time skips a bit, it shows like this big, amazing event, which I won't spoil, with all the characters, and there's this cool like anime, like picture that kind of ended the series, and it was really beautiful, I fucking loved it, and like that's an example where I'm like, they, it, it was an ending where like they technically could have given it the first time, but I was fine with this because one, it let me play the game a bit more, two, it wasn't really that annoying to get the true ending, like, like the, the amount of time it took to redo everything was maybe like an hour, or maybe two at most, maybe not even two hours, and also because, like, I just think the original ending was just so fucking funny. It would be one thing if the original ending they gave was just kind of, like, 
like a wet fart like it just like didn't matter it would be if it was just like okay but like it was just so weirdly out of left field i was like what is this bro like it seemed like fan fiction almost and so when i got the true ending i was like okay it, it felt even better getting the true ending because i had the contrast of what the ending could have been and so that was an example of a true ending i really liked Another game with a true ending uh, is Tokyo Xanadu, which I talked about earlier in the podcast, which is also, you know, a game created by the creators of Trails of Cold Steel. And pretty much what happens at the... So, spoilers for Tokyo Xanadu. Okay. But pretty much what happens at the end of the game is you kind of win, you beat the bad guy, but through the process, you end up losing one of your best friends. She just dies. And that's how it ends. And as the game is ending, there's this final cutscene and it shows you walking on the street and you see this kind of kid who looks just like your friend that died kind of walk past you and she looks at you. And pretty much what you're supposed to assume from that is that she got reincarnated or some shit, even though the ages don't really line up. But when you're walking past, this prompt comes up. I forgot what it says, but it says something like, do you want to go back or some shit like that? And pretty much if you accept that prompt, you you get like a lot more of the game, honestly. Like they gave like a lot of new content, which is interesting, where you have to go through a lot of new dungeons and get like these, I forgot how many, like five keys or something. And once you get the keys, you do this final boss. And once you do that, you're pretty much able to save the girl, like your friend that died and like everyone's alive at the end. And this is the final ending, which I thought was cool because one both endings i think were like fine like the original ending where the friend dies it was like a good ending it's just that it sucked that the friend died and the second ending is good because the same ending but your friend is alive this time and two i think it was really fucking cool how they handled like the second ending where like you don't have to replay anything really it was like new new stuff or new story you had to do to get it so i thought that was really cool so tokyo xanadu is a true ending i appreciate a lot now a true ending in quotes or secret ending that i didn't really like was uh east eight so East 8 spoilers. But from my understanding, the way East 8 handled it is that they had like a lot of endings. And what sucks is the way they handled it, and what sucks especially for me is because usually when I play games, like the Trails games, I try to do as many side quests as I can. And these days I do every side quest. With the East 8 game, I was enjoying it. I was enjoying it that much. So I, at some point I just stopped doing side quests and I just kind of rushed the rest of the story. Turns out the more side quests you do, the better ending you get. And so I did like, I don't know, like, uh, an okay amount of side quests so by the time i got to the end i got kind of like a shitty ending where like i'll just talk about specifics here but like you play as adol and you meet this girl donna on the island and you guys you know to go through the adventure and my ending was pretty much adol leaves uh, donna just stays on the island and it's kind of like a weirdly sad ending where like she's like okay i can't come by and then the game ends and it's kind of abrupt i'm like that ending kind of sucked. That was weird. I'm like, is there like a is there, is there like more endings? And then I Google about it, and yeah, it turns out the more side quests you do, the better the ending is. the The bad part about this is, to get the better ending, you would have to replay the game and do more side quests, which sucks. And I'm not sure if the game gives maybe the game does give you the ability to just like not replay the game and do more side quests. But like, it's one of those things like side quests is something you don't want to go back to and do and some of them are probably locked at this point of the game so like realistically if you wanted the the best ending you would have to replay the entire fucking game from the start finish every single side quest and at that point you're talking about like putting another 30 40 50 however long hours the game is just to get the true ending and so obviously in that case i didn't fucking do that i just went straight to youtube and searched the best ending and just watched it there but that's an example where there was a true ending the bad ending wasn't really that like it wasn't funny, it wasn't that good, it was just kind of like, okay, it's kind of weird. And to actually get the true ending, you would have to replay the entire game. So it was very weird, like, they didn't even give me an opportunity to get the true ending uh, myself, because like, I'm not gonna, they, they can't really force me to replay the game for that, that's kind of weird. But also, unless I missed it, if they were gonna have this, it really, this is a type of thing they should really mention at the start, where, like, at the start, they're like, hey, by the way, the more side quests you do, it will affect the ending you'll get. I think that's kind of a general enough where I'm like, okay, Thank you for letting me know and then based on that i will like see how many side quests i do and so because from what i from what i remember i don't think they had the message maybe they did but like because i didn't see any message like that and i would have to play so much of the pretty much the entire game again i would have to play more of the game again to get a better ending i think that was just like a poor execution of what a true ending could be but yeah those are just a few examples of true endings in games and like how i think trails of cold steel 4 and tokyo zanaru did a good job and east 8 i think did a bad job from here we will go into our final quick segment which is the top casual list for jrpgs now in terms of the top casual list for jrpgs if you don't know what this is this is pretty much a list i'm going to give out casually i didn't think too much of making a very specific list and thinking about every game i could it's a very casual list i got from the top of my head and if you guys have a list that's similar let me know down in the comments below if you disagree let me know too but the list i'm going to be talking about today is the top jrpg endings and so i'm just going to give my top three right away and then give you kind of reasonings for each of them and so my number three is east nine 
My number two is Kingdom Hearts 3, and my number one is Trails 4. So very quickly with East 9, East 9 spoilers, I'll be going through them, skip like 30 seconds to a minute if you don't want any. But East 9 specifically, it wasn't the ending that I think was good, it was pretty much the, the, the last, you know, X percent of the game where pretty much all the twists started happening. And spoilers the twist in the game was that the character you're playing as was not actually the character you're playing as a homunculus of him and even more spoilers the entire party you've known were pretty much homunculuses of people in history and so that was like a huge twist in the game and like i think that was such a cool ending where like i hadn't ever seen that before where like everyone you're playing as is kind of fake and it was i think it was well executed and they kind of like tied it up neatly where you fuse with your original body again so the memories are fine and it was just really fucking cool knowing that your party members were like homunculus of like important people in history technically because of what we were trying to do in the plot and i think it was just handled perfectly where like it could have gotten very messy and very weird and very like all over the place but i thought it was a very hard thing for them to try to accomplish and i think they accomplished it well and so that's why i like the east nine ending kingdom Hearts 3 i love the ending because of what they did with sora i thought that was very cool and very unexpected especially because this was supposed to be the ending of the zane or saga so i was fully expecting like this is gonna be like a clean ending and then like for the next game they'll do whatever but no they're like no fuck it sora's dead maybe he's just somewhere else and then he ends up being in shibuya and then we get a chess scene between young zane or and ericus of them kind of teasing that the foretellers might be the bad guys in the next game it was very fucking cool like i, I like enjoyed it a lot and i'm like yo this is a dope ass ending and i, and I straight up remember like i was playing like on my shitty like monitor setup at the time and like i finished the game and my mouth was just open when it showed uh Sora fade away from Kyrie, and I was like, what the fuck? Is he dead? I was just like, I was literally just sitting listening to the credits music, thinking about like what the hell this means for the future of the series. And so any game that can make you think like that, like any ending, I think is really good. So yeah, Kingdom Hearts 3 is up there for me. And number one is Trails 4. I've already talked about this a bit, but pretty much it's the end of a tetralogy it's the end of a huge series and i think when you get the true ending it handles it very well not really much more to talk about it since i already did but yeah it was just very nice very heartwarming very wholesome with the event that takes place at the end where they show all the characters just hanging out but yeah my top three are number three east nine number two king Wars three number one trails four and from there that will be the end of episode 15 of Spill the Tiro. If you're enjoying this podcast, let me know down below in the comments. If you did like it, leave a like. If you're new, subscribe. If you just want to listen to my voice and not see me, I am on audio services. And uh, I'd appreciate if you can like review and rate me on the audio services too. I, I forget to ask about this, but I really should be. But like, if, you if you're listening, if you can please give me the five stars, that fucking helps so much. I kind of read about it and like, it actually helps you a lot if you have positive ratings. So if you can do that, my podcast will be served to more people and more people will see it. So thank you so much if you do take the time to do that but yeah hopefully you enjoyed episode 15 i will see you guys for episode 16 next week peace